Okay, this year's F1 championship is getting really interesting and McLaren and to some extent Ferrari and Mercedes are moving forward. So why is this reshuffle taking place? Why are McLaren so fast? Why are Red Bull struggling and who is going to win the championship? So to fully understand what's going on, first we have to look at McLaren and how they made such a big leap forward this year. Now it might seem like this was all of a sudden, but this has been years in the making thanks to the large investments that's been made in the team. To find out more, I spoke with Lawrence Butcher, editor for Professional Motorsport World, and he agrees. You always hear it in F1 that there's no silver bullet, and I think for McLaren it's just all of the work that has been going on, the way the team operates, the resources it has, the people it has on board, have now culminated where you know they really have got the car and the team package to really get at the front. On a technical level, Zach Brown has been making some important hires, such as bringing in Rob Marshall from Red Bull as chief designer and showing that he's not messing about. And he's managed to bring up existing McLaren staff from the team. For instance, he promoted Andrea Stella, who's been with McLaren since 2015, to team principal after Andrea Seidel left the team in 2022. And figures like Peter Prodromu and Neil Hordley, who have a lot of history inside McLaren, were promoted to technical directors in aerodynamics and engineering in 23 and 24. Basically, Zach is not just hiring for the sake of it, and it's the same with his drivers. Oscar Piastri has been excellent and seems to keep on getting better and better. And it seems like it was worth the hassle with Alpine just a couple of years ago. And of course, Lando has also been fantastic, apart from the first couple of laps, of course. His stats for 2024 are the best of his F1 career so far. Three fastest laps, four poles, 10 podiums, and two wins so far. Enough to put him in genuine contention for the title. Most importantly though, Lando's two wins were in Miami and Zandvoort. And these were both Grand Prix in which McLaren introduced major upgrades. And their approach to these upgrades is an important part of their success, where they bring in big updates that seem to work straight away. Go back to Miami, they brought the big update there, and that was kind of the the start of their you know real improvement this season just that ability to have the confidence that when you bring a package that it will actually translate to on-track performance they've basically made a new race car for themselves working on 10 different areas of the car and from the aero parts to the suspension everything has been about increasing downforce in an efficient way and this has obviously worked because the result is a well-rounded car that's quick in the corners and still quick on the straights and the gains in performance are clear. Prior to Miami, McLaren made an average of 19.2 points per race. And after the Miami upgrade, this average increased to 31.1. And the same thing happened in Zandvoort. They brought in their second biggest upgrade package of the season with a further six changes to the car. Now, unbelievably, the last time McLaren won a Constructors' Championship was back in 1998, and the Drivers' Championship being in 2008 with Lewis Hamilton. But this year, I think they actually have a chance of getting both. For that to happen, though, it's not only about McLaren doing well, but also about Red Bull not developing too quickly and performing to the standards of the past few years. So, what exactly is going on with Red Bull? Well, before I get into that, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant. In their Exploring Data Visually course, I've built a solid foundation in data analysis. I've learned to filter, group, and manipulate data sets to turn raw data into insights that can be used to make decisions. Brilliant allows you to learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons. Now, I'm always busy, but with Brilliant, you can learn on the go in just a few minutes each day, building real knowledge on specific topics. My favorite thing is that each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving, and this method is six times more effective than watching lecture videos. So if you'd like to try everything Brilliant offers for a full 30 days for free, then visit brilliant.org forward slash drive61 to start your free trial today, or scan the QR code on screen. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thanks to Brilliant, and now back to what's going on with Red Bull. Red Bull haven't lost pace, but obviously McLaren have closed the gap considerably. The Red Bull seems to be a peakier car, a more demanding car to drive. And it also seems to be more sensitive to you know changing conditions. So the Red Bull seems to be less consistent than the McLaren, as we can see from the mixed results between FP1 and the race. Still, the Red Bull on its day is very, very fast. 
However, it doesn't look that easy to drive, and even Verstappen is finding it hard to handle, as we've all heard from him. I think there's the potential with the Red Bull that they have, you know, it's not that their aero program is not delivering downforce, it's that they've hit the limits of the, the mechanics of the car, and thus it's not able to consistently you know, use that load in the right way. What this means is the bits responsible for generating downforce are doing just fine, maybe even better than ever. But the parts that are responsible for handling and distributing the load are not working quite as well. And one of the issues could be the suspension. Red Bull started using a stiffer suspension when ground effects were introduced to avoid the porpoising. However, when they get to tracks that have more curbs and more bumps, the car is harder to handle and simply isn't able to generate as much grip as cars with softer suspension. And there are rumours of other factors playing a part, such as the FIA's asymmetric braking ban. And as the FIA rarely does this type of thing mid-season, a few people say that Red Bull's early advantage was thanks to an illegal braking system. And as Verstappen's Australian race was also plagued by braking issues, this was enough evidence that some people thought something illegal was happening. Now, the FIA and Red Bull both say that they never ran any illegal braking systems, but there are other factors that are also hurting Red Bull's title expectations. One of them, of course, is Sergio Perez. At the start of the season, he was doing pretty good, but since Imola, it's been pretty awful. And the numbers do the talking. Prior to Imola, 22.7 points a race were from Verstappen and 17.1 from Perez. That's a good average. However, after Imola, Perez has only averaged four points per race. That is not a good average. So while Red Bull are struggling to find out what works for their car, they have one driver who's getting almost everything out of it, while the other seems like he can't figure out how to drive it. And there's another issue that Red Bull have with the aerodynamics. There are several ways that the team develop their cars, from running CFD simulations to analysing on-track performance data. And when everything goes well, what the team expect to happen with their upgrade actually happens when out on track it's well correlated. And as I mentioned before, McLaren seem to have this perfected. I think with with McLaren, it's probably a case that they've just got all those elements gelling really well and they are hitting the track and it's doing what they expect. One of the key things for development is the wind tunnel, where they run aero tests on a model that's 60% the size of the actual F1 car. But the teams can't perform just an infinite number of tests as they have to comply with the ATR. That's aerodynamic testing regulations, which get reset every six months according to the championship standings. The ATR gives a baseline of 320 wind tunnel runs and 2,000 CFD items every six months. And the better the team's championship position, the less runs they get. This means that at the beginning of the year, Red Bull were only allowed 70% of the baseline figure, meaning 224 wind tunnel runs. In comparison, McLaren had 15% more, which translates to 48 more wind tunnel runs. And Red Bull seem to realise that they need to bolster their aerodynamics department. In just the last few weeks, they've listed eight aerodynamics roles on my career site, Fluid Jobs. By the way, if you're interested in a career in motorsport, go and set up some job alerts at fluidjobs.com. Now, after the mid-year reset, McLaren did lose a bit of aero testing time, but only by 5%. So they still have 32 more wind tunnel runs than Red Bull for the second half of the championship. So it's quite, you know, when you actually look at it in figures, that's quite a lot of parts to be churning through the tunnel and CFD that Red Bull haven't been allowed to do. McLaren have. And it's probably no surprise Red Bull are struggling. They've been limited to the minimum testing allowance since 2022. In fact, last year they even spent the entire team with a 10% reduction on that 70%, making it 63% of the baseline. This was due to the penalty they had to serve for 2021 when they went over the cost cap. So when you consider how little time Red Bull has to develop their car in the wind tunnel, it's absolutely vital that the facilities are the most advanced possible. But actually, Red Bull's current wind tunnel is pretty old, having been built 70 years ago to work as a military facility. It was later adapted to F1 standards when Arrows used it, and once they left the sport, Jaguar took it over, before Red Bull then inherited it in 2000. And, four. and Horner himself calls the wind tunnel a Cold War relic and agrees that they suffer with the tunnel's limitations, especially in cold weather, which 
is all too common in England. This is why they're currently working on building a new wind tunnel in Milton Keynes, which is expected to start running in 2026. And apart from the upgraded wind tunnel, Red Bull will also benefit from the tunnel and the factory being much closer. The faster you do it, the faster you can check that data, correlate it against your CFD, make sure your CFD is doing the right thing, and it just lets you bring stuff to the track faster. McLaren also understood this, as last year they started using their brand new wind tunnel at the Technology Centre. Before that, they were renting the Toyota tunnel at Cologne, which was really inefficient in terms of logistics and cost. And of course, the new facilities have state-of-the-art technology, improving the quality of the data from the wind tunnel. The way the tunnel operates as well will be more sophisticated in terms of what you can do with the models in the tunnel. And also it will be very subtle or not so subtle aerodynamic details in the design of the tunnel that just mean it will be more consistent. It will produce more of a you know, an approximation of reality. So with more tunnel time and better facilities, McLaren is at a major advantage this year when it comes to aero testing. So having all this laid out, who's going to win? Well, my personal opinion and guess is that it looks good for McLaren, but we still have eight race weekends left and things have been swinging around a lot this year, which as a fan has been absolutely incredible to watch. There's a double header coming up in Azerbaijan and Singapore on which the Red Bull might not like the bumps. And Singapore has been particularly tricky for Max these past few years. But after there is a four week break, which might be enough time for Red Bull to resolve some of their issues. On the other hand, Mexico is historically a Red Bull dominated track where Max performs well. But there are many races that can go either way, like Austin, Interlagos, Las Vegas and Abu Dhabi. So it is going to be incredibly tight. And we can't forget about Mercedes who seem like they're getting on top of their car once again. And to add a bit more interest, Ferrari just had that incredible result in Monza. So I think that the McLarens have the edge. And with two strong drivers, I think they'll take the Constructors Championship. But having two really quick drivers might hurt their chances in the Drivers' Championship, where Max still has a big lead. At this stage, the McLaren drivers are separated by 44 points. So even though Norris is ahead, theoretically Piastri could still win the championship. And because of that, McLaren's approach is to just let them fight each other according to the Papaya rules, which Zach Brown explained to be clean, non-aggressive racing, focusing on the team. But it didn't seem like that happened at Monza. This gives me flashbacks of the Weber and Vettel Red Bull situation back in 2010. And maybe it's no coincidence that in all of this, Piastri's manager is Mark Weber. Now, this is relevant because even though Lando is ahead, he's really benefiting from the advantage he built on Oscar until Monaco. During that period, Norris got 48 points ahead. And ever since, the pendulum has been swinging between the two, with Norris now seemingly only having the advantage in qualifying and Piastri seemingly a harder racer. And Piastri has developed really fast. He's constantly improving. But after the incident between Piastri and Norris in Monza, I think Norris might draw a line in the sand. Oscar was more aggressive than I think was right. And considering how Lando ultimately held back in Hungary, I would be rethinking my approach if I were him. If I were in his shoes, I wouldn't let that happen again. I'd say to Piastri, if you do that again, will have a crash. Still, this is one of the best seasons in recent history because it's so hard to predict. But if I had to guess, I'd say that Norris will be the champion if he ups his aggression and also McLaren back him fully. I want to thank Lawrence for giving me his time. You can check out his work at the Professional Motorsport World magazine or on the Twitter handle below. I made a video about how an F1 car would be designed if there were no rules and you can see that on screen right now. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I'll catch you next time.